Hey, good day, folks. Welcome back to another episode live from Jerusalem with Rabbi Chaim Goldberg. I so appreciate everything he shares with us, and the classes are just getting better and better. Uh, he's still continuing in the book of Genesis, and I happened to miss last week's class. I was busy, and I had to be somewhere else, but I am back today, and I look forward to every word that he shares out of Torah. We've got a full Zoom room today. we got people from all over, from Norway, from uh, uh, Arizona, from Tennessee, and Israel, and it's just such a joy to be with uh, such wonderful people. So I'm not going to oh, delay any further. Rabbi Goldberg, how are you today? Oh, we got Angela up on the screen. <laughs> Rabbi, you've got the stage. Hi, good evening, everybody. Good evening from Israel. Um, I must uh, admit that we were a bit uh, frustrated today um, since uh, we had... Um, we organized a very big Zoom meeting with uh, more than 30 people from uh, Brazilian people that uh, wanted to do the pledge. And uh, for more than an hour, we were struggling with the Zoom because the Zoom was uh, had a lot of problems. Uh, and I was a bit uh, terrified also. Next week, we also have uh, something like 30 people from the yeah, English speakers from all over the world that uh, are going to do the pledge. And then we have, after that, more than 30 people in the Russian language that they're going to do, and I hope that the Zoom will recover themselves and start to work properly because it's a bit uh, annoying in those days to lose the Zoom. So good evening from Israel. Now everything is working well, and this is good, good for us. Um, since we started things um, from the beginning, from the foundation, so we have still things to um, recover that uh, maybe we spoke about them or some of them we spoke uh, earlier, um, you know, something like a year ago, but it's okay. We can uh, also repeat things. This is part of the way of learning the Bible. And then when we are repeating things, we are managing to adjust those things in much a uh, proper way uh, inside. So um, so let's, let's straight ahead start uh, with things. Uh, I want to... Uh, today to conclude something that is related to the heaven side and to start to work or to start to discuss things that are happening more in our world. Uh, we said more than once that uh, everything that happened in the first three chapters of the Bible, um, not really, it's not really exactly what we can understand in our world. Okay, It happened in heaven uh, when someone's uh, grandpa is dying, so we're saying to the young uh, grandchildren, we're saying to them, Grandpa went to heaven. We see the body here, and the heaven is up there, and only the soul side. And on the same level, the three first chapters of the Hebrew nation are more speaking about things that are, I will say, in principal ideas somewhere. So let's learn something that is related to a principal idea and then we'll start to work and to speak and discuss things that's happening here in our world. So we'll share the screen and we will go straight ahead inside and I want us all to remember, okay, everybody can see the screen? Yes, done. I'm done. Everybody can see the... I'm using the Chabad uh, translation because I think that they have the best translation um, today to the English uh, language, even though they also have problems because every translation has a problem. But this is an open source and uh, I'm using this most of the time and it's okay. So you can also use this uh, translation. Before we will start exactly the scene that uh, happened between uh, the snake, okay, so serpent and the, the, and the woman, before we'll start with this, let me shut this down for a moment. We don't need this to bother us. Okay, I'm going back. I want to remember for a moment exactly, or to remind us of exactly, what exactly God asked from Adam and Eve. Who remember what God, what God asked from Adam and Eve? Who remember the wording of God? It's in chapter two. Who wants to try? It's okay. You can also, everything is okay in this room. Nobody remembers. It's okay also. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yes, Timothy, yes. He said uh, something, uh, you can eat of all of the trees of the garden, but 
the tree of the in the midst of the garden. You shall not eat of. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much. You're saying exact the exact words. God said you should eat from all the meats, all the sorry, all the trees of the garden. Uh, we saw this last week, and when he's saying that in the Hebrew language, it's even more emphasized that you need not only to eat but also to have a good meal. You know, eat from everything more and more. In the Hebrew language, it's really emphasized this uh, point. Therefore, it's very um, strange, I will say, when the serpent is saying something else. Please, Dan, read the verse number one in chapter three. Verse number one. Now the serpent was cunning more than all the beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And it said to the woman, did God indeed say you shall not eat of any of the trees of the garden? Suddenly he's saying just the opposite. Okay. In the beginning, we know that God said you should eat from everything. Except for the one tree. And we explained last week that this one tree, you can eat it also, but you need to eat it after you ate from the tree of life. Now, the serpent is saying suddenly, you should eat from anything. So the reaction of the woman already is a bit, I will say, hesitating, okay? She's saying, um, she said something in the middle. She's not really saying what God said. She's saying something a bit less than God. Please read the verse number two. Verse two, and the woman said to the serpent, of the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. We may eat, again, Let's remember, God didn't say, you may eat from the, uh, from the fruits of the gardens, uh, of the garden. God said, you should, you should eat. <laughs> we said that even last week, we uh, showed this. We remind us of some things that we have already learned, that while animals are, living, are eating for living, we as humans, we are eating for... <laughs> now that we are living, we need to eat more and more. And it's not that we are eating for living. The eating is something that is expressing that we are acknowledging more and more knowledge. And this is what we need to do. So now the woman went to, uh, we'll say to um, some sort of an explanation because the serpent started with a very, I will say, negative situation, negative uh, um, expression. While God said, you should eat from everything. The serpent said, you should not eat. So she says to him, you know, we may eat. And from here, we're learning the first thing that we are learning is that uh, when someone has almost everything in his life, usually it is very tempting to go to the things that he is not allowed. And when he is looking for the things that he is not allowed, everything is very bad suddenly because he is emphasizing his view only for the things that he is not allowed. And this is where everything is started to corrupt. Where God gave us everything in this world, except for one small thing to do it in a different way. But because he said to us that this is something that is not allowed, as human, we are looking at the thing that we are not allowed and we're asking ourselves, ah, we want this very much. Therefore, nothing is useless because I can't get or achieve what I want to achieve because this is something that I'm not allowed to touch. This is how everything is starting to get upside down with things, with ourselves, and with the behavior that we're doing in, in our life. Um, there is a verse uh, in, uh, in, in the Bible that says that, it says in, in Hebrew, it says that um, when you have um, water that is being stolen, it's very sweet. When you steal water, it's very sweet. And on the same level, Something that is allowed and not allowed, this is what I want. So everything else is, is useless, is, is worthless, is nothing, because I want the things that I'm not allowed. And this is where the woman started, I will say, the corruption of the of eating from the um, in the garden what she wasn't allowed. But let's go another step because she's doing another big mistake. So please read verse number three. Verse 3, uh, but of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it, and you shall not touch it, lest you die. Whenever, do we know where God said this part of the sentence? 
It's not, not mentioned. Enough. He didn't. He never said it. <laughs> God never said it. Maybe, maybe Adam said it to Eve, you know, <laughs> so she will get far from it. But this is something that he made it. She made it, sorry. She made it. And this is where she fell down. This is where she uh, missed everything because the serpent is very simple now. He is answering her, you will surely not die. And the, and the Hebrew um, the sages are saying something very interesting. They're saying he, the servant, he pushed Eve on the tree and she touched the tree and she didn't die. And this is what he said to her. You see, everything here is a bluff. So the second thing that we see, the first thing that we see that when someone is putting his heart and his ambitions and his will to the things that he is not allowed, this is his first mistake. The second thing is when he is starting to exaggerate, to bring more and more things to this not allowed situation. This is the second uh, fall, second thing that is bringing him down. And the third one is in verse number five. Please read verse number five, Dan. Five. Eve, for God knows that on the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened and you will be like angels, knowing good and evil. So it's, uh, again, in the English, it's not, a, it is not saying the exact words. Uh, it's not only angels. In the Hebrew, it says, you will be like God. You will be like God. And what, uh, again, what the sages are saying, I think Rashi is saying this also, if I remember correctly, just a moment, let me see it here. Um, here it is. Please write, read Rashi for this, uh, this part. Only this part. You can Rashi it. says, For God knows every craftsman hates his fellow craftsmen. He, God, ate of the tree and created the world. And from Genesis, Rabbi 19.4. And you will be mm -hmm. like angels, creators of worlds. From Pirkei, okay, the again, Rabbi so Elias. Uh, Elias. Okay, so what we're saying here is we're putting inside now the jealousy between God and men. I think that we spoke about this a few times already. That uh, this is the third mistake that drove Eva to start to look at the tree and to eat it. And the third one is that it is some sort of a jealousy between God and man. Instead of understanding that God who created this world because of his own free will and is giving us life because of his own free will, because this is what he wants to do. And he's trying to help us, to assist us, to come to, I will say, to accomplish our mission here. And he's looking for someone that will be like God on the way that he have the free will. It's not a robot here, but someone that can be partnership with God. Instead of looking on this way, um, the relationship between God and, the, and man, she started to look on the relationship like a jealousy situation. Like this is what the servant said, told her. It's a jealousy. Who is going to be better? Who is going to be more smarter? Who is going to be the one that is managing to rebuild those, uh, this world? And those are the three, I will say, um, the three stages where we are missing the point. <laughs> when we are managing to do, um, a, I will say, um, sin. The sin is starting when, first of all, um, when we uh, focusing on the things that we are not allowed. And then it's continuing when we exaggerating. And it's continuing more when we think that it is better for us to enjoy the sin instead, to, uh, instead of understanding that it is our more benefit and better for us to get related with God by acting on the way that he is asking us to act because he knows also the way of getting connected with him. And when we are losing those three things, this is where we manage, we're coming to um, verse number six. Please don't read verse number six. It's a very, it's a very sad one, but we have no prayer. <laughs> and the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise. So she took of its fruit and she ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Okay, this is what led her to the situation 
those are the three stages that led to the situation where she did the sin. And as we, we know also, uh, we know also that it's still today, this is the way that people are losing, I will say, their behavior between men and God when they are focusing on the things that are not allowed, when they're exaggerating, when they think that it's going to be more beneficial for them to do those things. Those are the things, those are the points where people are losing when we're speaking about the relationship between men and God, and this is what happened in heaven. And uh, we all know the results. The result is that men, Adam and Eve, were kicked out from Eden. And since then, we're moving to another, I will say, um, how do we call it? It's another dimension. Instead of trying to improve the relationship between men and God, we have, we're putting a lot of emphasis of the relationship between men and his fellow men. And I want to show this. This is the next part of the, this is the next stage of the lesson, I will say it like that. I'm finishing here. I'm not going to continue on inside to what happened there uh, between uh, Adam, Eve, and God. Okay. We, the main thing that we spoke already more than once uh, that uh, they had, we said it, uh, we mentioned it, that uh, they had, uh, I will say, um, fear from God. They didn't have the courage to stand in front of God when he's asking them, where are you? What is your purpose in life? They're not answering. I'm here. Here I am, like Abraham did 2,000 years after that. Bless you. 2,000 years after that. But more that they're saying, we are terrified. We don't know what to do. So they lost, or they did a mis big mis and a mis uh, interpretation, misbehavior between men and God. And God, what God is doing, God is uh, moving them out from Eden. It's not here. It's, it's the next uh, chapter. Just a moment. Let me, okay, let's continue on. On the next chapter, we can see that God is taking them out from Eden. And I want to show what is the next stage of human. Uh, oh, maybe we'll... Uh... Chapter 3. Uh, I, I want to read, no, I want to, I want us to read the, in a moment, something very important. Uh, here it is. Please read verse number um, 21. 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife shirts of skin, and he dressed them. Okay, now, usually what we understand from that, that God had a lot of mercy, and even though they didn't obey to his I'll say to his words, to his uh, um, mitzvah, even though God uh, created for them um, dressing. He, did, he had a lot of mercy to get uh, created for them uh, dressing. But uh, it's also saying here that before we went out from Eden, we didn't have any body and we didn't have the skin on the body. Okay? We were only souls. This is what I'm saying all the time. Those um, chapters are not speaking about what's happening here. So God created the body and he said in the next verse, that's it, enough. Behold, I can't uh, have that man and Adam and Eve will live here. Let's kick them out from Eden. And then we're coming to chapter number four and we're starting to learn um, the new things after God basically um, Throughout, and it's also something that I'm saying a lot of him. Please read the verse number, uh, number 24. 24. And he drove the man out, and he stationed from the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim, and he made and the blade of the revolving sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay. I won't go inside to this uh, blade of a revolving sword and everything else, but I want to ask where exactly do we see that God is kicking out Eva from Eden. <laughs> right, it only says he drove the man out. <laughs> More than that, read from verse number 23. <laughs> and the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the soil whence he had been taken. To whom God is speaking about, to whom God referring when he's throwing him out. Only to men. It was supposed to say, you know, to, to, until the, to till the soil and to um, give birth for children, like, like he said before, verses, a few verses ago, part of the things that he 
said to the woman that it will be hard for her to give birth. But it's not saying anything. It's not referring to the woman. I'm saying this a few times, and I said it a few times, and I'm, say, I'm showing this also in the verses. In the verses, it's not saying that the woman were kicked out from Eden. Okay? So if you're asking yourself, why are they here in, in this world? Because we, the men, people, we, we can't really... Um, we don't know how to behave without the woman. <laughs> we have a lot of work to learn from them. <laughs> but uh, so they did us a very good day, I would say. Uh, um, they were very nice, kind with us, and they, wanted, they came also here to, to this world. Um, and now let's, yes, you have questions. It's okay. This is the time because if not, we're going to move to the next. Uh, Rabbi, can you scroll that back down for a second, just at the end of 23, when he um, removed them out of the garden, okay? Uh, just this point with Rashi, and now lest he stretch forth his hand. Um, you know, it says in with Rashi, and if he were to live forever, he would like be likely to mislead people to follow him and to say that he too is a deity. Uh, there are also Agadak uh, Midrashim, but they cannot be reconciled with the simple meaning. Now, Rabbi, I've always understood that uh, the reason that they were expelled was lest they put forth their hand and take and live forever thinking they could continue to take. And it's almost like, you know, a child that puts their hand on a hot stove. If a child puts their hand on a hot stove, the, they burn themselves, right? And they learn never to do that again. But when you're dealing with um, the world and people taking things, now we know that one of the no hide prohibition is against theft and things of that nature. Um, but if people, uh, whereas the hot stove has an instant reaction, Hashem removed him from the garden lest he put forth his hand and take and think it's okay, he got away with it and he can continue to get away with it. I think that that's the way that, that good parents discipline their children so that they don't do something again and again and again and think they can get away with it. It's almost like setting a precedence. If you let your child get away with it, with something they shouldn't be doing, they then do it again and again and again, and and you're not teaching them a moral lesson. Is that not why, or is it? Uh, what, what you say? No, what you're saying it's it's very. Um, I will say it's true, but it's a very the simple level. We've learned already that it's not that God didn't let them to eat from the tree of life, of the tree of the um, of the good and bad and good. Okay, but He wanted the order to be in the right place. And the order is, first of all, have the right values of life, eat the tree of life, and then eat from the tree of the good and bad. Because if you will eat first from the tree of the good and bad, and, and then from the tree of life, you won't put the right meaning inside the good and bad in your life. And what God basically wanted, that they will repair back what they did. And this is a, another level of understanding. So what you said, it's, it's true. But again, it's uh, one level. A deeper level is to, or more inside level, is to understand that now men need to repair himself and not to live in a sin all of his life. And this is why God is saying to them, go out from, a, go out from Eden to repair the things that you did. And the repair will start with a relationship between men and men. And this is where you will find the exact more the exact way of life and from there you will be able to also to put inside yourself also the tree of um, the tree not only of good and bad but also the tree of life in the right way after you will behave in the right way uh, unfortunately we are not in this position well, maybe we'll manage to come to this uh, we are not in this position yet okay we, we're getting closer and closer but we are not in this position yet um, but we, we are starting to understand that God moved to a different uh, dimension. If the dimension in Eden was the relationship, to repair the relation, to, to build up the right relationship between men and God, now we're moving to another dimension before the dimension between men and God. And this is a dimension between men and his fellow men. And this is what we're going to see in the next uh, chapter. So please, let's Excellent. say... Let's go on to the next chapter. And the next chapter, we said, I will mention this and then we will continue on to the most important part, okay? Um, please read this uh, verse and also uh, the first part of Rashi, okay? Now, 
Now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, and she said, I have acquired a man with the Lord. Now Rashi says, now the man knew this took place prior to the above episode before he sinned and was banished from the Garden of Eden. Also the conception and the birth took place before. For if it were written this way, it would mean that after he had been banished, he had sons. And that's from Sanhedrin 38b. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going inside to the vocabulary of the Hebrew language now, even though we are, we are all allowed to learn Hebrew, but I'm not, I won't go inside to those um, technical details. But the main thing that we learn here, that we were not... Uh, in the Christian world, they are learning that this chapter is coming, and now Cain and Abel and everybody else were born after the sin. Therefore, from the beginning, every person who is born in this world basically is holding on his back um, the sin of Adam and Eve, and he needs some sort of mercy from God. But the Hebrew uh, language, it's not written like that, and it's not what it says here. It says that they were born before the sin, and we are not holding on our shoulders the sin of Adam and Eve. So this is a short note that I'm saying. This is huge, yeah. And, but uh, is, uh, I think we mentioned it, but I want more to continue on. One of the things that we've learned uh, very much a few times that in the Hebrew language, the name of the person, it's also the purpose of his life. It's the same word. The word name in Hebrew is Shem. And Hamatara, the, the purpose in life, it's the same thing, the same word, the word Shem, Le Shem Ma. So when you have um, in the Bible, name of a person it's also contained inside the purpose of his life and we explained this in a we explained this already but i'll explain this again cain his the word the word cain is mainly saying that he bought everything already everything in this world is related to him he he took everything and he accomplished everything in this world. Now, we need to understand. We said this. We need to understand what's happening here with Adam, Eve, and Cain. Adam and Eve, uh, it's another thing that we need to learn. When someone wants to be close to his friend, to his mate, he's supposed to be uh, related to him in his will. When I have the same will with everybody else, Okay, we are all sitting in this class because we want to learn Genesis. So we have some sort of a connection in our will. Therefore, we have connection together. But if I feel one thing and you feel the opposite, so we are far from each other, even though we're sitting one to, next to each other. We can see this also in the politics in the United States. Okay, when you have someone from the Republican and someone from the, um, how do you call the other side? They have a lot of uh, debates between one each other, and it's very hard for them to, to love one each other because they are from the two different parties. It's because the will is different. Now, God's will is to give life. Adam and Eve, the main thing that they had in their life, they received life from God. So they are very, very far from God. They, are very, they have a, very, a lot of distance from God. Okay? And Yahila Nibsi Haim, Hebron also the Buddha, the Kola Lam, the Sea Shu, or Hazi, like. And if you see Ukaraga, I'm a Rabbana Shimihul, and there's all a Hobam Shik, like. So Adam and Eve very, have a very big distance from God, and think also for the next stage. God also kicked them out from Eden, so they are feeling very far from God. And what happened when Cain suddenly was born? They felt that the Messiah came. <laughs> we are not only receiving life, we are also giving life. Ah, we're getting closer to God. Ah, suddenly we can feel much closer with God. This is Cain. This is why we say in the Hebrew language, the word Cain is finalized. He is finished. Basically, the Messiah of this world came to this world. Cain is a Messiah. Okay? Till here, it's okay? 
let's go to the next verse because the next verse is uh, um, okay the next verse please verse number two verse two and she continued to bear his brother Abel and Abel was a shepherd of the flocks and Cain was a tiller of the soil uh, we need, uh, before we're going to speak about what each one of them did, uh, and it's also related to the name, let's um, speak for two minutes about what happened in the first part of the verse. First of all, she continued to bear. This is also surprising. Why do we need another one? We have already one, and one is giving us, I will say, um, the feeling and the understanding that it's like the Messiah that you know everything now is is great. I'm also giving life, not only receiving life, and but she's continuing. And another thing, it says his brother. Now I'm asking, do of course it's his brother. The Bible is not saying any um, you know word, any useless word. So. What exactly it's trying to say to us here that this one was his brother, Cain's brother. We know that it was Cain's brother, okay? If another one is being born in the, in the family, so it's his brother for the, the one that was before. So what exactly the, uh, the Bible is trying to tell us here? And the last thing that I must say, say is the word Abel. The word Abel in Hebrew is nonsense, okay? You don't, need, you don't really need it. You don't really need it. This is the word Abel in Hebrew. Abel in Hebrew is, and we're saying, don't forget, we're saying that the word, the name of the person is also his destiny, his purpose in life. So we're starting to understand that Abel is useless, not really need, he's needless. We don't really need him here. Now, those two words, his brother, those are the words that are showing, I think, the most important part of what's going to happen in all of the history from the days that we were kicked out from Eden to the days of the Messiah. The word brother in Hebrew is containing also the word, um, the beginning of the word responsibility. Responsibility. Now think about this again, do for yourself a short imagination. When the first one is born in the family, everybody is admiring him, kuchi muchi puchi muchi, speaking with him. <laughs> and he is the most important person in this world because he is going to be the continuous of the next generation. He is the next part of the generation. When the second one is being born, for the first one, he is needless. Who needs him? Who needs him? In Cain's perspective, Abel is useless. I don't need him. So what exactly Abel, I will say, mission in this life? He is supposed to teach Cain that there are other people in this world, not only him. He is sure that he is the most important person in this world. He is a Messiah for his parents. He is bringing, you know, um, the most important uh, message in this world. My parents are not anymore only selfish people. They are also giving life. They're not only receiving life, they're also giving life. I don't need anyone else. No, no, no. You need someone else that will teach you that there are more people in this world. And if you won't understand that, what will happen? You're going to kill your brother. <laughs> this is what's happening. So for the perspective of, of uh, Cain, okay, Abel is needless. We don't need him here. But if you look on the purpose of life of Abel, Abel was shepherd. So in the beginning, it starts with shepherd of flocks. But this is his mission in life. He is supposed to shepherd others, also to shepherd Cain. While Cain was dealing with the soil, you know, he was the, dealing with the garden, with everything else. You know, he was working very hard. He's continuing his father's mission in life. He was working in the tiller of the soil. Exactly what his father also was supposed to do. He is continuing the next generation. But he is supposed to have someone there that will 
teach him how to shepherd, how to deal with others. And what we know that's happening in the continuous of this um, story is that, just a moment, I'm jumping here a bit, that in verse number eight, we see, I will say, um, the biggest, uh, another, another time in history that we are damaging you know, our mission. Please read the, verse number eight. Verse 8, And Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So we see here that uh, we failed again, second time. But this time, it's a failure between men and his fellow men. And it's written down here twice. His brother, his brother, you know, he killed his brother. He, he lost it's, it's emphasizing that he lost the brotherhood. The main thing that he was supposed to bring to this world, those two brothers, they were supposed to bring the brotherhood between them. So if Adam and Eve did a big mistake with the relationship with God, Cain and Abel did a big mistake with the relationship between him and his fellow men. Wow. Again, Cain is very high level, because we see that God is speaking with him and everything else. We never saw that God spoke with Abel. Even though we know that uh, more than that, we said it more than once also, that uh, who is getting the most hardest punishment? Um, Abel. Abel is being uh, molded, and we never see him anymore, not him, not his destiny, anybody else. And if you will go to the last um, book, of the, of the Bible, it's, he's not even mentioned, uh, Abel, okay? That's it, he lost, he got lost. Uh, Cain destiny, we have Naama, part of the destiny of Cain that will get married with Noah and together with Noah, she will rebuild the world again. But I want to go to continue on and to show on, on all of Genesis, um, to start to understand, I will say, the structure of the Bible and why it's written down. So I want to show in all of Genesis, the brothers and what happened there. Okay, let's go for a moment to a tour in the Genesis uh, stories. So let's continue on to Genesis number 12, I think. Yeah, I think so, it's 12. Genesis number 12, it's showing about another two brothers, okay? And the, the brothers are Abraham and his brotherhood Lot. And they are, they are joining together. They are working together. Let's see. I know I will find it. In verse number four, and Abraham went. Please read verse number four, Dan. Verse four. And Abraham went as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. So Lot is joining Abraham. Okay, went with him. But Lot is a very important person. And we will see, and then they're going to the Egypt the land and they're coming back and everything else. And um, oh, it's the next uh, chapter, I'm sorry. It's the next chapter. And then um, they're going back from Egypt to Israel, to Canaan. Please read the verse number one. And Abram came up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that was his, and Lot with him to the south. Okay, so they're starting to walk, to walk together from Egypt to Israel. And we see that in verse number five, uh, please read verse number five and six. And also Lot, who went with Abraham, had flocks and cattle and tents. And the land did not bear them to dwell together, for their possessions were many, and they could not dwell together. Okay, so now we're starting to see two very, from the same family people, that something there is starting to get wrong, I will say it like that. And if we'll read verse number seven, please. Seven. And there was a quarrel between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and between the herdsmen of Lot's cattle and the Canaanites and the Perizzites were then dwelling in the land. We don't know exactly what happened there, but we know that there was some sort of a fight between, first of all, the servants, not 
Abraham and God. And then Abraham is saying something amazing, amazing. Listen, please read verse number eight, loud and clearly and carefully. And Abram said to Lot, please let there be no quarrel between me and between you and between my herdsmen and between your herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Now it says here we are kinsmen, but we see, it says in the Hebrew, Ki Anashim, Achim Anachnu, we are brothers. We have some sort of brotherhood. And the solution is that let's be separate between ourselves. You will go to the settlement in Amora, and I will stay in the land, in, in the other part of the Israel land, and we are we're not going to kill one each other because we are brothers. So we see that there is some sort of a trying to get, uh, not to come to the position like Cain and Abel, not to bring the solution of one is killing the other one. Okay? This is the first, uh, okay, let's go to another generation. The next generation is, we know the generation, who, is, who was the sons of Abraham? He had two sons. He had two sons, right? One was, Ishmael, and the second one was uh, Isaac. Okay, those two sons. So let's see what's happening between those two sons. Let's see if I, I think it's uh, number 20. This one. Uh, maybe it's the next one. Okay, please read verse number uh, 9 and 10. 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, making Mary. And Sarah said to Abraham, Drive out this handmaid and her son, for the son of this handmaid shall not inherit with my son, with Isaac. So we see again, we see, now Rashi is explaining that he tried to kill him. Okay, the son, he was already 13 years old. Uh, he was uh, older than uh, Isaac, and he tried to kill him. And this is where Sarah is saying, no, 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 let's do a separation. Again, so we see that brothers are trying to kill one each other or to have some sort of a fight. And the solution, let's separate them. Let's continue to the next generation. Who is the next? Who are the sons of Isaac? Who are the sons of Isaac? We know them. Jacob and Asaph, right? Of course. Those are the sons of Isaac. Let's see. Um, nah, next one. Just a moment. 27. Yeah. We know what happened there with all of the blessings and the cursings and everything else. And then we and the see... Lentils. Exactly. And then we see we need to learn those things also. And then we see an amazing verse. I must explain this verse in not only in what and the context that we are speaking, but also I will say in other words about here. Um, please read verse number uh, 41. Don't forget they were twins, those two brothers. Right. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing that his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, Let the days of mourning for my father draw near. I will then kill my brother Jacob. Oh, wow. I have a brother. It's, it's my brother. <laughs> we, we were born together in the same womb. But I'm going to kill him. Just I will have the exact timing, okay? After my father will die. Until my father is alive, all the days that my father is alive, it's very hard for me to kill him because I still believe in some sort of God uh, that my father believes in. It's hard to kill when I believe in God. But when my father will die, I will be secular. And when I'm secular, it's very easy to kill Jacob. When I, build, when I will be secular, it's easy to build up uh, the chim ch uh, gas chambers and all of those things. And to kill the Jews, it's not a problem then, because I'm already secular. I don't believe in God. This is what happened in the last day, in the 
beginning of the 18th and 19th uh, century, okay, when we had all of this uh, big uh, situation where most of Europe became secular, they didn't believe anymore in, in God of, of my father. And uh, it led them also to, in Europe, to, to do this uh, awful thing that we know about uh, um, what happened there. But again, we see brothers are not managing to cope together. So let's go to another generation. So, and we know that Jacob ran away and uh, he came back only after 21 years and they met one each other and uh, they got separated also, okay? Each one of them went to a different part of the land. Uh, Asaph went to the, um, to the south place and uh, Jacob stayed in the land of Israel. Let's go to the next generation. Who, are, who is the next generation? Who do we have in the next generation? Um, we have Joseph. We have Joseph and his brothers. <laughs> we all remember Joseph and his brothers, right? It's also a very known story. What happened there, jo Joseph and his brothers? Uh, it wasn't the most uh, easiest, I will say, uh, situation between those two. <laughs> But but Rabbi, you'd think you'd they'd get the point that you you're talking about right now that that people are to rectify their relationship between man and man, along with their relationship between man and God, especially generation after generation after generation, and it's still antagonism between brothers, between those that uh, are kinsmen. Uh, uh, yes, but I want to show I want, what I want to show here. It's much a uh, we. Let me finish. You will see why the Genesis book is finishing there and why the redemption of the, of the second book of the Exodus is Excellent. coming. I will show this in a moment. So read, please, verse number um, uh, three and four, please. Three, and Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was a son of his old age and he made him a fine woolen coat and his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers so they hated him and they could not speak with him peacefully all right so we see also again especially between judah and, uh, and uh, joseph and you will see it in a moment because um he's doing all his dreams and everything else and they are really um being jealous in him and they're hating me more and more. And um, he is saying something amazing, okay? Joseph is saying, I'm looking for my brothers. Tell me now, where are they uh, pastoring? Pastoring, yes. Yeah, pastoring. And uh, the answer that this strange man is saying to him, um, they traveled, they are going, they went away. And we can see that in their um, reaction. Please read. Uh, verses number 18, 19, and 20, please. 18, and they saw him from afar, and when they had not yet drawn near to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. So they said one to another, Behold, that dreamer is coming. So now let us kill him, and we will cast him into one of the pits, and we will say, a wild beast devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. Okay, wow. So, so the brothers are try, intending of killing him. At the end, they didn't really kill him. But here we see, uh, I think uh, this is where I will say it's the turning point of what's happening. Because when the, Joseph is managing, after all what he passed on in Egypt, and he became the king of Egypt, and he is also giving a lot of food to all of the countries, not only to the Hebrew people. And at the end of the end, when they starting to understand the, his brothers, what happened there? Let's see in a moment how Joseph is reacting to the point, to the time where they understand, uh, when they realize, oh, I'm so sure. when they realize that uh, they're standing in front of the person that they were sure they're going to that they killed him. Okay. Uh, oh, it's not here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's continue on. I think it's here. Just a moment. No, no, no. I need to go a bit back. One back or two back.
When Joseph is, please read the verse, verse number one, first of all. Verse number one. Now Joseph could not bear all those standing beside him, and he called out, Take everyone away from me. So no one stood with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Now, um, read verse number three. It's a very important one. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him because they were startled by his presence. Well, they, they were very startled. They were very uh, amazed. They were very um, shy. Everything else, everything that you can say. But here, exactly what he's saying to them in verses number um, in verse number four and five. Okay, it's, it, I think that the, this is where we're starting to finish, to finalize Genesis. Because please read this and I will say a few words. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they drew closer. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not be sad and let it not trouble you that you sold me here. For it was to preserve life that God sent me before you. So, sir, we see here that suddenly the brothers, first of all, they're shy with what they did. Just a moment. Just a moment. Um, sorry. Um, first of all, we see that from one side they are shy, and from the other side, Joseph is really um, see. He sees that how much it was for good what happened, and he is not um, holding any bad feelings against them. And this is where we can start to close the Genesis book, where the fight between brothers is managing to close down. Not as a fight, and not as something that we're going to kill one each other, but we are managing to become close again, one to each other. Please come closer to me, and they draw closer. This is where we can start to close the Genesis book. Suddenly, there's a family here, okay? We started with Cain and Abel. We went in this family along the history, and we saw from generation to generation how much they are fighting, okay? Those two most important people there. Each one of them was holding himself as the most important person, and the other one was supposed to get uh, killed. And only at the end of the days, when we're coming to a situation where they had a big fight, and instead of killing him, they sent him to Egypt, they sold him to be a slave to the Egypt, uh, I would say, uh, um, country. And after a few years, you know, something like uh, 22 years, uh, let's say, sorry, after 17 to 32, um, after 15 years, they uh, again meeting him and they're managing to get together. This is where we can close the, um, the story of Genesis. But let's go move another step. And the next step is that we have in the beginning of the Exodus book. Okay, in the beginning of the Exodus book, we are man we managing to find another two brothers. And those two brothers, one is Aaron, Aaron and the other one is Moses. Who is the most uh, oldest one between them? We know that Aaron was Aaron the is, one. yes, of course. Aaron is the, is the oldest one, okay? And Moses is the youngest one. And who exactly God is asking to go and to take the people, the, Egypt, the Hebrew people out. He's asking from the youngest one, exactly. So I was thinking that the oldest one would be jealous. Maybe he would like uh, to kill him, to tell him not to come back to Egypt, not to bring the, not, not to do those things because the oldest one is, you know, with his, uh, he's supposed to take the, the, the leadership. And listen what's happening here in the, In verse number 14, please read verse number 14. Verse 14, and the Lord's wrath was kindled against Moses. And he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he will surely speak and behold, he is coming forth toward you. And when he sees you, he will rejoice in his heart. Wow. 
Suddenly we're finding something new. The oldest one have a lot of rejoice that the youngest one is managing even more than him. This is where the redemption can come. <laughs> we're moving to another stage, you know? It's not only to close the Genesis. When we're starting to see that the second one is getting preference from the first one, and the first one is also glad with this preference, this is where we can bring the redemption and I will say, I will show you um, in, in another three chapters how the Bible is uh, showing, I will say, there's a very, very important verse there. How I, first of all, read, read, read verse number one, please. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you a lord over Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, will be your speaker. So they're working together. They're working together. Just a moment. Uh, so I, want, I wanted the uh, verse from uh, there it is. Please read verse number 26 and 27 and see something very interesting there. 26. This is Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Take the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt with their legions. They are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel out of Egypt. They are Moses and Aaron. So we're starting with Aaron and Moses, because Aaron is the biggest one. And we can, we're can finalizing with Moses and Aaron. And we see that they are managing to cope together, even though each one of them have a different... I will say, um, a mission in life. And the oldest one is being a um, helper for the uh, youngest one. And this is where you can bring the redemption to a full nation. Because it's not only that you have the brotherhood like we saw in Joseph and his brothers, but you have more than that. You have also a situation where those two are managing to cope each one of them in the right place, even though it's not on the birth side, I will say it like that. And this is, if you look on the mission that we have uh, today, I will say, in, in our days, in this world, the mission that we have, this is the main mission, the mission of the brotherhood. Now, today, we're also speaking about nations. Not It's not only speaking about people, but also the nations between one each other. And this is the most important thing to understand. Where exactly we manage, I think we said this question a few times already, Dan. Um, do we have enough food that there won't be any hunger in this world? And the answer, we know that there is enough food. So why isn't the food being spread over in the right way? So because we know that there are also a lot of people who are dying because of starving today. And the answer is because we have people like... Um, I want more. Take more. I don't want to say names, but we all understand. <laughs> but they want more, they want to take more. They are holding countries in a way that is not being with a brotherhood with others. Instead of being with brotherhood with others, they are more taking for themselves. And this is where we're losing. And we have a lot of fights and everything else in this world. So the Messiah didn't come yet. Can I add a point, Rabbi? Because, I mean... You brought out the beauty of the rejoicing between uh, uh, Aaron meeting Moses. But to back it up just a little bit to the story of Joseph, you, you brought out a really big point. I think that after those statements that we shared uh, in the final, near, nearing the end of the book of Genesis, I believe that one thing that Joseph said that was a change, a catalyst for the group of his brothers to understand was uh, Joseph had said to them that, you had intended this for evil, but Hashem intended it for good. And I think that that is when they understood. They were in that deep, dark famine. They tried to kill their brother. There was multiple numbers of them, just like we have the nations, the 70 nations today. There might be a lot of them, but, but what you're saying about those that are maybe overtaking from the, the sustenance pool of life when they... They should be sharing abroad. The Joseph's brothers 
understood when he said they intended it for evil. They threw him in a pit. They sold him into slavery. And more than that, they thought he was gone, long gone. But Hashem rose him up to that place of prominence in Egypt. And there they are standing before him. And he said, you intended it for evil, but Hashem directed it for good. And that brings it all the way back like you started in the book of Genesis, the relationship between, between Hashem and man, and then, the, then out of the garden between man and man. And, you know, I just love the way you've been sharing out of this course. Now, first of all, you're right. You're saying a very good point, and it's a very important point because uh, this is part of the things that we understand. You know, the word uh, repeatness and the word uh, what we say in Hebrew, tshuva, um, it's, it's a bit different than what... Uh, I need to bring. I need to do um, a lesson about this word, about this uh, concept, because uh, it's something that uh, usually we're using the same word, but we are doing. We're speaking about different uh, explanation. Yeah, yeah. And what you said, and what you said, is starting to understand the exact meaning of repeatness, of where God we're putting um, our trust in God, and we are really withdrawing ourselves from bad things or bad actions that we did, and God is. Uh, oppositing all those uh, actions to good instead of bad. And this is one of the things that uh, also the brothers managed to see when Joseph spoke with them. And Joseph is mentioning this thing. It's true. And here I wanted more to emphasize the connection of the brotherhood that we see along uh, Genesis and where we can close Genesis because suddenly or oh, at the end of the days of, the, of this family, the brotherhood is managing to come together. Okay, all the 12 tribes are coming back together one to each other. And to understand the redemption that we will have in, a, in the second book, in, in the Exodus book, because of the excellent connection between those two brothers, where the oldest one is giving the space for the youngest one to lead more than him, even, even more than him. And they're not, they're not only that they don't have fights, but they also... A lot of ha, have a lot of honor between them and each other, and this is the way to bring the redemption by understanding each one his position or his role in this uh, in this complex, and this is uh, where things are managing to, I would say, to get the right values. Beautiful, yeah. well said, Rabbi. Scotty, yes, you wanted to ask something. I see that you suddenly, I, I, we see you in there. I do. I can't hardly stay in my seat. <laughs> uh, we have a saying, I'm sure you have it there too, is I, I can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, you, have, you have been able to pull the trees out of the forest and explain the trees and then put the forest back together. So okay. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question, and I may or feel free to correct me, but as we see this struggle for brotherhood, and you have completed this position today. Is that also a meta metaphoric position between the B'nai Noach and Israel? No, no, no. No, B'nai no, no. B'nai no. B'nai Noach but and Rabbi, Israel, Reb, Rabbi, after Noah, they were brothers. Shem, Ham, Japheth, they were brothers. And and exactly. after the... Exactly, exactly. No, no, no. The Noah, the Noahite and the, the Israel doesn't have these uh, problems of brotherhood at all. I don't know that. Uh, what I know, I know that the Noahide and the Israel mate, and it says also, it's being said also, declared also in the Sinai, and not only there, that the connection is very good, very strong, the Noahide people and the, um, and the Israel people. And we can see this also in the Solomon King uh, age, where at those days, and not only on those days, but for the 400 years that we had the, the temple in those days, um, People came from all over the world and gave a sacrificing and other things. And there is in the temple, there is a, the place where um, also Noahide are coming inside, the Jews coming inside, or not just the Hebrew people, and the Levitaks and the, also the Kohanim, they can come. So there are stages there, but the, the first stage is for the Noahide. We never saw um, a contradiction or fight between the Noahide and the Israeli people. So nothing, in, I mean, I, I guess I was thinking of like in the past how uh, Israel has been treated, is is that being changed? But I guess that's that was a um, 
I'll keep that in my seat. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's true that in the time of the exile, that we were outside, I would say, until the beginning of the last century, um, we have we had uh, we worked very hard to survive. So we didn't really work. We didn't really spoke about the Noahide mission. And today that we have our country, we are speaking about our mission. So this is true, um, I will say, logically. But it's not because of a bad connection between the Israeli people and the Noahide people. Just, you know, we were working for surviving. <laughs> this is what we did. Uh, but uh, we, we, we never thought that there is a problem or disconnection between those two uh, well, sections. Thank you for your class today because I can hear the wind whistling through the trees. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm going to use those words, you know, I'm going to use them so to promote the class. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, we, we need to finish another two, three minutes. So if someone else wants to mention or ask something, this is the time. If not, we are, I need to go on. I need to give uh, this line to another group that is going to learn tonight. You know, Rabbi, uh, this is, uh, believe it or not, the, the 52nd episode in this uh, class, believe it or not. That's, you know, when you take out the holy days, you've been going out this class now for north of a year, longer than a year. And mm -hmm. um, you've covered so much ground uh, today. It, it just feels like you've, uh, yeah, taken us to a place that, uh, yeah, is, is, a degree of fulfillment. So um, I want to thank you. That's a lot of uh, Genesis you've shared. And, uh, you know, even though some of it you'd shared with me before, you were able to expound on much more that I thought was uh, was great. So it's always a joy, and it's always a joy to see the group growing. It's always a joy to see Noahides growing, you know, and online. So um, I have nothing more to say, Rabbi. If we're still continuing with this class, you let me know if we're still good for next week. I oh, know yeah, that the yeah, group yeah. is growing. We, we are going to have next week. Why not? And you can share this with others and others can come uh, uh, to be with us, uh, you know, to, to take part in those classes and live also. But it's okay. It's okay. I do want to ask you a question privately sometime, Rabbi, this week, if it's, if it's possible. Um, but... uh, hopefully tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon we will have time and call me and I will call you and we'll speak, okay? And the private day. Yes, it's a holiday here in Canada tomorrow. So, yeah, it's all good for me. It works. <laughs> well, folks, I've had a great class today. It's so good to hear the culmination come to the, the, the end of the book of Genesis. There's so much in there. There's more that you can study for, for not, not just a year, but years and, and still dig and learn. So um, we're honored, Rabbi, that you would share out of Jerusalem. So uh, if you've got to close this class down, then uh, let's shut her down for the, today and we'll catch you all next week, folks. So uh, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Excellent. Bye. See you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.